good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for being here uh, very, uh, very early. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jason Moore here for the, today for the uh, seminar. Again, it will be a combined seminar, part one uh, talking about the uh, educational philosophy as, as he sees it, and part two a, uh, a lecture on uh, the EME 122, um, uh, what's it, uh, vi vibrations. Um, so uh, Dr. Moore uh, received his PhD here uh, from uh, uh, UC Davis, and then uh, he went uh, uh, to the uh, Cleveland um, uh, State University, uh, spent a year there as a postdoc, and then recently moved back to, uh, to the Sacramento area, and he is one of the uh, candidates uh, for the position of a lecturer of security, uh, potential security of employment. So without further ado, Jason, go ahead. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy and um, glad to be here and uh, give it, have a chance to share with you a bit about my teaching philosophy. And the, over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to try to give you an idea what that is and how it may fit in with the department. If you want to follow along, um, there's a link there too uh, with the slides. There will be some links um, that you could peruse uh, uh, after, the, after the lecture, for example. So just a little more background about myself. <clears throat> I grew up in Virginia. I got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at Old Dominion University. And then I came out here to UC Davis and I received a Master's and PhD where I studied the human, con human control of vehicles. I was fortunate enough to spend a year at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands under a Fulbright grant, also working in human control of vehicles. Um, while I was in grad school, I co-founded and ran an educational nonprofit, Dave, the Davis Bike Collective here in town that you may know about. And I'll speak to a couple of points that are relevant uh, from that experience in my talk. And then most recently, as Kay said, I was a postdoctoral researcher for two years at Cleveland State University where I worked on powered exoskeleton control. <clears throat> so my teaching philosophy, I think I can sum it up in these nine points. And those, I'll just go through them. Um, number one, let the evidence choose the instruction method. Two, increase the desire to learn by leading with realistic problems. Three, assess as much and often as possible. Four, teams are good for students and teachers. Five, never stop learning to teach. Six, diversity is crucial. Seven, each student is an individual. Eight, teaching materials need not be redundant. And nine, computation and theory go hand in hand. So I'm gonna go through each one of these points in the talk, um, explain um, a bit about the, the point, and also give you an example of either how I've implemented something from these philosophies in, in, what I, in my teaching, or also how um, uh, that, that philosophy was inspired. So to start, um, the first one is evidence-based teaching methods. I firmly believe that we should let sound, validated research guide our decisions in what teaching methods I use, we use. The, um, there's a lot of people thinking about how to teach, and they do a lot of research, including here at the education school, and we need to be able to consume that information and use that to guide us. The book on the right, How Learning, Lurks, work, How Learning Works, is a sort of teach the teachers for college instructors book that was very inspirational to me. It has seven principles uh, that are very practical ways that you can change your class such that uh, and do certain activities and do, do certain methods that will ensure uh, better uptake and learning. <clears throat> for example, I've taken um, I've, I've, gone, I've gained uh, and used various um, teaching methods over the years. And some of the things that I've done, for example, I've tried to break my lessons into 15-minute sections uh, so that we don't overextend people's um, uh, attention span, which is around 15 minutes usually. Each of those 15-minute sections are broken up by student activities, whether it be a short multiple po choice question that the students can answer or, or work in pairs or groups to answer, or maybe even a longer uh, group, group work assignment, uh, whether it be writing or some kind of problem solving activity. I'll also ensure that I collect lots of feedback during, um, uh, during my teaching. And that means in the lesson multiple times if possible. And I'll talk more to that. <clears throat> uh, I share rubrics with the students. Rubrics are known to um, sort of set an equal playing field so students know what, you, what, what is expected and, um, and what you're looking for. 
I also uh, have students, when they get their exams back, instead of just looking at the number grade, fill out a small form so they self-evaluate how, how well they did, how much study and time they spent to uh, prepare, and then what they could do to, to, um, uh, to do better next time. And that's shown to uh, have a lot of influence on in increasing learning. And finally, in lab courses, I, um, especially in lab courses, I, I stick to hands-off teaching to ensure that the student actually does the action um, when they are uh, learning and it's, and it's shown to, learn, to uh, ensure that they, they learn better. Learning. The second one <clears throat> is to increase desire to learn by leading with realistic problems. From day one, I would like our students to understand what engineering really is, right? And engineers solve problems. <clears throat> so I would like to, from, early, from the freshman year, allow students to work in multidisciplinary teams that um, are made up of maybe business school students, um, other, other majors, and, and uh, especially other engineers, so that from day one that they can learn how to work in teams and, 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 get in, and really be inspired by the problem they have to solve instead of just presenting them with um, uh, all of the material that we expect engineers to know before they can solve problems. <clears throat> and I would like to see curriculum designed around those, those ideas too. Um, in, a, in, broader, bigger, in a broader, bigger sense. Uh, one example that it really inspired me was when I was at the Delphi University of Technology. Uh, they had a fantastic freshman course in which <clears throat> all the freshmen are entered in. It takes about half of their time for the first year. In, in reality, it's, it's very much like our senior design courses, except it happens in the freshman year. And they're tasked with creating a complex machine. Uh, they're put into teams. The teams are co competitive, <clears throat> and, and there's some goal. And uh, it was really impressive to see engineering students that have no engineering skills uh, create machines that could scale a wall, um, uh, rowing vehicles, all kinds of complex things that may even rival what we would see in senior design projects in a lot of schools across the country. Um, so I'd like to see something like this bringing more uh, problem-driven um, learning um, at an early, early stage. The next is assess as much and often as possible. So I mentioned feedback already, and feedback is crucial for not only teaching practice and us getting better uh, as, a as a teacher, individual teacher, but also for us to make decisions about curriculum design. And we're in the day, to, uh, the day, of, a uh, the day of data, the age of data, is what I'm sorry, and <clears throat> we can collect this information in a lot of ways. So. I want to make use of that along with clear goals that we set so you can use the feedback and see whether you're meeting your goals um, to make decisions on um, how to improve teaching and how to improve curriculum. And I'd love to institute methods that makes this very easy for instructors to do. As far as curriculum design is, co is concerned, I think that curriculum should constantly evolve. Uh, we shouldn't have classes that stagnate. Um, they should change each year and we should be explicit that we want that to happen. Um, we should set five, 10, and 20 year plans <clears throat> and reevaluate after every quarter or year to see how, if we're meeting the goals. And, and keep our classes up to date with the times, up to date with educational teaching um, practices, up to, Kate, up to date with um, changes in the field. And if we collect data to make these decisions, it also gives a strong case uh, when the accreditation agencies come around to see whether we are doing what we are supposed to be doing. As far as um, feedback in, um, in teaching, I uh, use lots of methods, but uh, one that I like the best that's very simple and quick is that I pass around um, sticky notes, two of each color, and you, you all take one of each and pass it around. <clears throat> I'm going to take feedback from you at the end of this uh, demo. And I usually have a green and a red for not good or and good. And uh, the students can stick the note on their desk, on their laptop screen, on their shirt, whatever. And it allows the teacher to see quickly whether students understand. Um, if they have green, you know that a lot of greens in the room means that things are good. And if you start to see a lot of bads, well, you need to back up and explain, th explain things, hopefully, in a different, uh, from a different viewpoint. And during um, each break, I can take these, have the students write a positive and negative point from the class. Uh, whether I'm doing a bad job explaining something or a good job or they don't understand something or they would wish that I would talk about something else, 
I take those up and it takes literally five minutes to go through 50 of them and get an idea of what the state of the class is, mid-class, and you can adjust your teaching afterwards. <clears throat> the next is that teams are good for students and teachers. <clears throat> so we, I think we probably all agree that um, teamwork is, is really important for students, and I believe that too, and I want to have my courses um, uh, built around teamwork more, than, more so than individual work. Uh, but use metrics um, like peer evaluation and um, contribution tracking to be able to get individual grades out of team contributions. And I think this is critical to have our students prepared for the jobs that they're going to have that are all um, going to be team-based, most of them, right? And secondly, I also think te teachers work good in teams. <clears throat> I um, have uh, had a lot of fun team teaching in the past, and I'll talk to one of those, talk about one of those. I work for a group that's a nonprofit called Software Carpentry. The whole mission of Software Carpentry is to teach two-day workshops to scientists and engineers to give them the fundamentals in software and scientific computation so that they can do the work that they're expected in graduate school. We teach automation, reusable code, and structured data and version, version control. There's always two instructors per course, and one instructor drives the course, essentially, while the students are doing active learning the whole time. And the other instructor roams the room looking for those red stickies um, that where students need help, right? And they can help keep the students that are lagging behind up, up and, and pace with the lecture. And this uh, is just a great experience that I've had um, that I hope that I can find some other partners that may be interested in doing that here at the university. Uh, never stop learning to teach is my fifth teaching philosophy point, right? If you think that teaching can be mastered, um, you all know as teachers that it, that it probably can't. It, uh, it is a moving target. Things always are changing, right? Every new group of students is different than the last. Every um, <clears throat> um, uh, course material changes, new advances in the field. And we have to keep up to date and constantly teach ourselves uh, uh, to, to stay an ex as an excellent teacher. So some of the things that I plan to do uh, if I were to have this job <clears throat> are to utilize feedback, like I said, in a, in a more broad way. Also want to get involved with uh, the communities around engin engineering education, participating in conferences and, and uh, reading the relevant uh, literature. Uh, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning here at UC Davis is an awesome resource that um, is there to help us become better instructors. So they're going to be my new best friend. And then finally, um, there's a relatively new program called I Am STEM here at school, and they have a whole team dedicated to catalyzing the improvement of undergraduate STEM education. And the strat three strategies that they um, propose on their website is there, and I will certainly be connecting with them. But I also want to help other people grow too, the other, other instructors. In particular, I would like to work with TAs. Um, to collaboratively um, really enhance the TA training program and, um, and also uh, support the TA consultant program. I'd also like to be available for you all um, to come in and give you a uh, critique on your lectures if you'd like, and we can hopefully both do that for each other. And then finally, for bigger experimental ideas, uh, pursuing um, educational grants like the NSF do opportunities <clears throat> will definitely be in the book once I find some suitable collaborators to do that. Number six is that diversity is crucial. This plot, which we've probably all seen, or something similar, shows the percentage of women that get a bachelor's degree in all the engineering disciplines, right? The average is 18.4%. Most of us wear that's a pretty dismal number. Uh, unfortunately, mechanical engineering is even more dismal at 11.7%. So I'm aware of these. Um, we also have issues with uh, bringing more minor other minority groups um, uh, higher percentages in engineering, and I'll be dedicated to um, helping change those percentages for the school. <clears throat> so um, what to do about it? This is a, a tricky problem to solve. There's no uh, uh, grand way that you can tackle it, but <clears throat> I've had a few experiences in my life that I think will make me uh, be a strong ally to the groups that, um, that we need to increase uh, he, uh, in engineering. Uh, work at the Davis Bike Collective was very inspirational. We had a mission statement that uh, ensured that we made safe spaces for uh, people that weren't 
typically found in a male-dominated bicycle repair teaching space. Uh, ground rules are set, and we have zero tolerance for pe people breaking these rules about um, uh, creating spaces that um, are uncomfortable for people that aren't traditionally welcomed there. And <clears throat> I've also worked internationally a lot. I've worked, done engineering work in uh, Zambia, and Guatemala, and the Netherlands, as I've mentioned. So I think I have a pretty good picture of what it means to be international or an international student. And, um, and those experiences have really changed the way that I see the world and work with people um, that uh, have English as a second language, et cetera. <clears throat> so number seven is that each student is an individual. Um, every student, right, they have different motivations for being here, different motivations to, for learning. They have um, different methods that they learn best. And we always have to keep that in mind as a teacher. We, there is no magic teaching solution that's suddenly going to make every student um, learn the best. So I just wanted to denote that, <clears throat> uh, that that's very important to me to keep in mind that uh, students are individuals and that we have to design our courses and our activities and our um, uh, behavior with them to recognize that. The eighth point in my teaching philosophy is that teaching materials need not be redundant. <clears throat> I've worked a lot in open source software development where we have hundreds of people developing uh, some common uh, thing, software in this case. And I, and I have a lot of ideas of how that may be applied to teaching material development. Um, I would love to work on shared material design, uh, modular lesson design, and uh, collaborative, massively collaborative ways of creating that. Um, we already have a couple examples here at the university. The chemistry department has an undergraduate collaboratively created textbook called the UCD Chem Wiki. And I'd love to see that kind of thing in, in, our, in our realm too. I have a lot of experience with this also with the software carpentry group. We have hundreds of lecturers that um, work around the world teaching our courses and all of our materials are, we have one core set of materials but they're, they're collaboratively developed by, developed by these hundreds, hundreds of people and it constantly changes. Each time somebody teaches the class, feedback comes in, and we update the lecture material. <clears throat> so this um, massive scale collaboration are some of the sort of side projects that I would um, be interested in having some of my course materials go this way and see if we could develop some of the core materials um, and have collaborations around the world on those. The ninth and last point in my teaching philosophy is that computation and theory go hand in hand. As, as I've noticed, uh, 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 already noted, I um, have a strong interest in computation um, and teaching it. And I truly believe that in the day of where we have masses of amounts of data to deal with and we can use that data to understand the world, um, there's more than just theory ex and experimentation that give us a view into explanation of the, wor of, uh, the natural phenomenon in the world. And the next one is, is computation. <clears throat> so I think the combination of those three um, that put them in equal, equal, equal settings will uh, empower students and help them learn, uh, giving them a third avenue to, to learn uh, engineering concepts. <clears throat> I'm going to show in my demo lecture uh, one example of that. I create interactive lecture notes, and that means it's not just a piece of paper or a slide. I literally... I'm going to pass the students a book, a, um, a, a, a document on their computer or their device that interleaves theory, text, multimedia, and interactive computation so that they can visualize graphs by sliding parameters and seeing how things change. And I think the future of um, uh, passing on information is going to be um, a very interactive textbook. We're not only gonna, no longer really going to see paper versions. And so I already utilized these things in my class today, which you'll see. So those are my nine teaching philosophy points. <clears throat> and I want to touch on a few other things, a uh, couple other things, uh, to close out the talk. The first is that I believe that I'm well equipped to teach all the classes that are listed on the screen here. I have a strong uh, background in mechanical design and manufacturing. So I think all of these classes that um, I could step in and, uh, and be able to help teach. I've already taught engineering four here and have that class uh, built at a base level that I would like to develop further uh, if, if possible. And I've TA'd the other classes in bold. All of my graduate work and postdoctoral work is in dynamics and control and biomechanics. So 
I feel like I can step in and also help teach in many of these dynamics and control courses. And finally, um, as I mentioned in the ninth point of my teaching philosophy, I uh, find scientific and engineering computation uh, that it needs to be more of a core element in all of our courses. And especially, I have a lot of ideas uh, from teaching novices how to program and how to, in, in, how to, how to do computation uh, that I think could help um, grow some of the core fundamental first year classes in computation. I've also picked up other things outside of uh, around uh, that I would like to teach. Uh, early on, I mentioned, mentioned the uh, freshman multidisciplinary uh, design course. I would like to certainly like to develop something like that. And I have some other sets of uh, topics that interest me, like system and parameter identification, optimization, um, bringing software development to, in, uh, to mechanical engineers so that they can develop apps that read the data off their machines and analyze it and control it. Um, and also, I really love multi-body dynamics, and so I'd love to explore some of the uh, modern advances in, in multi-body dynamics. The job description also mentions that you are interested in having somebody with mechanical design experience. I have a pretty strong background, I think, in mechanical design, uh, uh, starting with uh, developing full-scale um, uh, wind tunnel apparatus at NASA Langley. Um, <clears throat> I've also worked at a compressor company briefly, and I uh, developed, developed a lot of experimental apparatus that um, basically everything that I, I worked with, I, I created myself uh, in terms of experiments. Also, in my undergraduate, I, uh, I was on many of the uh, student extracurricular teams, these, um, the Formula SAE, uh, the ASME Human Power team, and I have a lot of experience and understanding of how those um, uh, teams work and, and a lot of the design experience that those taught me too. I've worked a little bit in maglev train design. And finally, um, I've spent a lot of time doing appropriate technology for the developing world. And like I said earlier, I've spent time in Zambia, Guatemala, doing wheelchairs, human-powered ambulances, and other human-powered machines. Um, I would love to mentor students in this topic and also uh, be able to maybe even have some courses. And uh, there's some other groups on campus that are, that are working on these things. So that, uh, closes my teaching talk. If you go to this URL, um, all of these are links that can take you to more materials to learn about me. Uh, my CV, teaching statement, and diversity statement for this job. <clears throat> I also have a sample course website for Engineering 4 that can give you an idea of how I've organized materials for the students. It has all the lecture notes and, and various other materials. Uh, example of me teaching, which you'll also get to see today. Design experience. And finally, the last link is going to um, uh, be used in the next lecture and interactive uh, lecture notes that I'll, that I'll demonstrate. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a number of questions on, in terms of uh, teaching. For sure. Yeah, unfortunately, the system right, sets it up to be very competitive. Everybody has to have the top GPA. That's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the game. It's also the nature of real world, right? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I would say to answer specifically how I would handle that, right, I think the most effective is, is peer review, right? It's, it's pretty powerful. Um, what, if you know that your peers are going to judge you and have influence in your grade, that uh, that can... Peer review means, do you ever watch this game called the uh, what's it called? Survivors? No. But anyway, they, they all regard each other very well. I mean, nobody wants to. It's, it's a, the difference between democracy and leadership. I mean, they, I, I've done that before, and they all, I mean, everybody gets an A, basically. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's the philosophy. If you have a student, peer review. You can develop a system where you want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, the grade wouldn't totally be about the peer review, right? The grade is also... Yeah. So yeah. Peer, review peer review is one. 
And the other way is that we have mechanisms of tracking contributions. And this, this doesn't apply to um, everything equally, but um, if you take measures of particular contributions from the students in an objective way uh, throughout the, the, the assignments, you can collect that and, and, and use that as, a, as a, uh, a view to how students work together in progression. And, and that can come from peer review or also TAs or students' observations. And that, that's the, I'm, I'm not claiming that I know exactly how to do all that, right? You've probably taught more undergraduate than me, no, but, no, but, uh, <laughs> no, oh, you haven't? Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to be dedicated to answer, figuring that out and answering that question in the future for sure. Jason, I've, I've, I'm happy that you're here, and uh, you know we know each other a little bit from your from your time here. And I know some of the things that you've done in teaching. There's a lot of innovative ideas that are here, and I, I, uh, uh, you certainly present them very credibly. And I'm I'm convinced that you're going to go after a lot of those ideas. Um, I wonder about pulling people along with you, you know, and how that how that's how that how you perceive that's like likely to go. Pulling people along with me? Yeah, because in the end, right, you're, you're one man and a 35-person yeah. faculty, yep. right? And I mean, I think you have to think about that a little bit. For sure. And, and, you know, can you pull people along with you? Do you think that's possible? And how would you do it? I think it's possible. I mean, I think we all get infected by other people's passion for things. And, um, and certainly some people will, uh, will, that will happen too. Um, <clears throat> And also, maybe I'm a really good marketer and I can sell it and convince people to. I, I don't know. That, that's, all, that's part of the game also. But um, I guess what I can promise is that I'm going to work hard and I'm going to try these things. And we're going to see what works. And if it inspires people, then I, hopefully I can, I can gain a following. For example, the, the software carpentry group I work with, they started, um, I don't know, 15 years ago. And it was one man, right? And he's a very infectious man. And he, uh, to this day, uh, gathers up grad students that help teach in a very effective uh, way. And, um, and so I'd, I'd probably use methods like that to uh, get people excited. And not just here in the faculty, too, um, broadly, too. I'd really like to expand uh, collaborations beyond, um, beyond just the faculty. We have time for one more question, Rem. Yeah. You're trying to get me into a contentious fight, I think, with that question. But um, <clears throat> uh, that was a statement. Do you want me to respond? <laughs> um, I think it's debatable what a real programming language is, right? If you want to teach algorithm and algorithms and um, and use computation to let students see the world of engineering from a different way, um, it can be done with many languages, and they don't have to be, com you know, uh, very difficult, hard compiled languages. Um, in fact, uh, all the most taught language in CS 101 across the country right now is a very high level language like MATLAB. Right? It's not. All of the CS schools across the country have decided to stop introducing students with the lowest level languages and give them the tools so they can get to the things that they want to and, and the big broad concepts instead of worrying about whether you allocated a um, memory correctly. Right? So I, I personally think that um, any language, languages solve different, different, uh, different problems and, um, and there's a lot of tools that can solve lots of engineering problems. C certainly does, MATLAB certainly does. And, um, but as far as teaching, I think that uh, the higher level languages are, are a, a better, sh better shot, and I think that the world says that too. Uh, one, uh, ben actually had a question before you did, so. Okay, super. Else you have one quick question. 
Well, it's, it's more of a comment. Okay, another comment. Another comment. comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this whole discussion depends on whether or not you believe that computing and high-performance computing is part of mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, if you want to do bleeding-edge computing, you cannot do it with MATLAB. That's for sure. I so, agree. So, so that, I think, is the real distinction. Do you believe that high-performance computing and algorithm development and all of these good things are part of, 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 of the discipline? If not, then yes, MATLAB is fine. I mean, the, the main thing that I want out of my students <clears throat> is when they're faced with a real problem, that instead of only choosing to, to write it down by hand or going to a program like Excel or something, that they would see this, that there's another powerful tool that, that can give them better control and insight. And I think that's the key thing that we have. Developing high-performance computing skills is um, either something that we're going to see closer to the graduate level or specialization or, or in fields that aren't dominated by solving practical mechanical problems. Okay, I think we'll stop it there. We, um, next thing that uh, we asked Jason to do was to give a lecture on one of the courses that we uh, had identified. He's chosen EME 122 in vibrations, so for the next 20 minutes, he'll give a lecture on that, and then we can ask some more questions after that. Okay, to start, uh, I'm going to give a lecture on forced vibrations with viscous damping. It's an example from Engineering 122, probably one of the third or fourth lectures or so. What I'm showing you right now is this interactive um, um, lecture notes, okay? If you, I don't see anybody with a device, but if you have your phone or anything, right, you can go to that link and you can read along with me. And I would expect my students to do that during their class. Uh, and secondly, if you actually want to interact with it, there's going to be a little computation at the bottom where we can play with, with something. Um, you can follow those instructions. So that's, that's all about that for right now. And I'm going to work on the board beside it. Um, and, you can, and we'll see later uh, what that's all about. But the intro today, to give an introduction today, right? we've talked about free vibrations already. Uh, both damped and undamped free vibrations. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when we start to push on the single degree of freedom system uh, with a periodic force and how that affects the motion. <clears throat> um, this is important for many things in engineering, uh, whether you know, you're, if your washing machine is unbalanced, uh, your car riding over a bumpy road, or <clears throat> um, uh, a, an airplane wing vibrating in the, in the turbulent flow. So understanding the core concepts of, the, of um, force vibrations gives us an idea of how to, as engineers, how to either control these vibrations or utilize them. <clears throat> the goals today are going to be to derive the equations of motion of the system. We're also going to uh, solve the differential equation for the non-homogeneous differential equation to find the solution. And then we're going to investigate the steady state behavior of this system. <clears throat> You're going to have to remember from previous lectures, lectures um, uh, the vector method of uh, vibrating, mo vibrating motions. You're going to have to remember the solutions that we got for free um, damp systems. And we're also, uh, we've showed you how to make plots and things in previous lectures. Um, that's going to also be at the end uh, using computation. So uh, to start, <clears throat> We um, are going to start with our favorite system that we've been working with for the past few days. It's a mass M that's attached to a wall here through a spring with a spring constant K, a linear spring, and also a linear viscous damper that's in parallel with a damping coefficient C. Uh, we know that this uh, system has an equilibrium point. that we're going to make equal to zero. And when we move that mass to the right through a distance x, uh, we, can, we can activate the system. Now, the difference today is that we are going to add a force, a periodic force to this that's applied to this mass. We are going to impose a force and see how the system behaves with respect to that force. This force is going to be described by an amplitude F naught, and a particular frequency that we can set. So it's a periodic sinusoidal force that's going to um, change the motion. 
And what we're going to end up finding out is that this force is going to really dictate how the, the motion of the system is, uh, behaves. And these two parameters, omega and, um, and F0, are, are very important. So as you uh, recall, we first have to write a free body diagram. Right? We want to see what forces act on the system. The spring force pulls it in the opposite direction of the displacement. And also, the damping force slows down the motion. I need an x dot there. And, uh, sorry for that. And finally, we have the new force. If you sum these forces in the x direction, using Newton's second law, we can say that the mass times the acceleration equals right, a negative spring force and the negative damping force. And the force that we apply is in the same direction as the displacement. Right? So that's Newton's second law. We can write that in canonical form. This is a second order linear ordinary differential equation, right? It's a linear in the state variable x here, <clears throat> uh, except it's non-homogeneous. We have a right-hand side that is not 0. <clears throat> we can also write this, if you remember, if I divide by m, we defined some special constants that are very particular to this system. Um, zeta, the damping ratio, and omega n, the uh, natural frequency of the system. And these come from the same uh, free vibration um, understanding that we, we got before in the previous lecture. <clears throat> Recall that the, the damping ratio, I'm sorry, the um, natural frequency is just the square root of k over m, right? These are just other forms of the ratios of c over m and k over m. <clears throat> so if you look at the class notes, you can see the definitions of those to, to, get, a, to, to get a reminder of what those are. <clears throat> OK, so we have our equation of motion. And um, if you recall from your differential, differential equations course, right, <clears throat> the solution to a non-homogeneous system, x of t, right, the position of, as a function of time, is a combination of a homogeneous part and a particular solution. In the last lecture, we figured out the homogeneous solution. So we know that answer. And if you recall, it's an um, exponentially damped sinusoidal motion uh, that, that happens at the damped natural frequency. Okay, so you can look also in the notes uh, while I'm teaching to get a reminder of that. But today we're going to focus on the particular solution. And the particular solution, if you recall, it gives us a picture of what the steady state solution of the system is. What happens after these transients die out and what the system looks like in long term. So to <coughs> To uh, get, a, get a hold of this particular solution, we need something that satisfies, satisfies the equations of motion, that differential equation. And I'm going to suggest that we pick a particular solution that looks something like this. And we've seen this before in the um, uh, previous lectures in, in free vibrations. And if you recall, Right? This is equivalent to a sum of a sine and a cosine. Right? And the key thing is if I differentiate this twice and plug it back into my um, equation of motion here on, on the right, <clears throat> that <clears throat> I can get sines and cosines of omega that are going to equate on the right-hand side of the, of the equation of motion to um, f sine of omega. 
omega t. Okay? So we're going to work with this form that's trigonometrically equivalent, trigonometrically equivalent to this. And we're very interested in what happens to the amplitude and the phase of this particular solution as a function of the force that we apply to the system. Okay? Um, to do that, you can get to it, you can get to this solution algebraically, but we're going to look back to uh, the method of the vector method of thinking about vibrations, right? We can think about all vibrations as rotating vectors, phasers. <clears throat> I'm going to define the magnitude of the displacement, x naught, to be in the vertical direction. And then we're going to make a vector for each force, each of the four forces in the equation of motion on the, on the left, right? And so the spring force is going to be in the opposite direction of the displacement. And it's going to have a magnitude of KXO. <clears throat> the damping force is going to be a vector at 90 degrees, right? Because we have to take the derivative of x to get x dot, and it always creates a 90 degree vector. And the magnitude of that, if you remember, will be C omega x naught. And then um, we take one more derivative, and we get a, a vector for the inertia force, m omega squared x naught. <clears throat> and finally, we need to add the last force, and that's the uh, periodic forcing. But we know that this lags x naught, the uh, displacement, by an angle phi. So we can draw that phi away from x naught. These are the four forces in the system. Newton's law has to hold. So we can equate, we can make sure that these vectors equate to zero. Excuse me. <clears throat> and we can do that by summing the horizontal components and the vertical components of this system. The horizontal com com component of these vectors is uh, c omega x naught minus f naught sine of phi, the sine component. And that must equal 0. Forces must balance. The vertical component has the inertia force, the inertia force, <clears throat> plus the cosine of f naught. Oops. And the spring force. These two equations are going to allow us to now solve for the amplitude of the displacement and the phase angle. If you um, solve for sine and cosine in each of these equations and square them so we can get sine squared plus cosine squared, we add the two equations, we can, I'll go back over here, we will find out that x naught looks something like this. Right. It gives us an expression for the amplitude of the displacement as a function of the input, the uh, periodic forcing amplitude, some system, the, uh, nat the uh, system constants uh, for the spring and the damper, and also the frequency <clears throat> of the applied force. The phase angle, if you take the two equations, solve for sine and cosine, and then divide the equations, we can get expression for tan of phi. And tan of phi uh, looks, I'm probably going to forget that one, looks like this. Right. So this gives us an this gives us an expression that tells us how uh, the phase angle depends on uh, the input frequency. Right. So <clears throat> what we can do further is we can write these equations in terms of the ratios that we like to try to use. Right. It's going to give us a simpler picture of the of the of the system. And if you do that, sorry. We have F over K on the top, and in the, in the bottom, we have um, 2 zeta omega over omega N 
squared, each of those squared, plus 1 minus omega. Oh, I apologize. That's incorrect. The squares over here. All right, so that gives us <clears throat> this uh, function for the amplitude in terms of the um, uh, ratios here that are a little more convenient terms, which we'll see in a few minutes why, why that is. And the tangent of phi equals 2 zeta omega over n, omega over omega n, divided by uh, the same thing we got there. Okay? So that puts us in this form. Notice that we see omega over omega n repeat a lot, right? This is called the frequency ratio. <clears throat> and it's typically denoted with the symbol R. Okay? So that's a new ratio that we introduce. Um, that ha you haven't seen in the previous lectures, and that's the ratio of the, apply the uh, frequency of the applied force to the natural frequency of the system. Okay, with these two equations, <clears throat> now the fun happens. We get to think about what they mean and how they can help us understand what's going on. <clears throat> so if I can, th I can think about a couple of particular va values of um, omega. For example, what if omega, the applied frequency, what if you're moving that, that force so slow that it takes like a million years for it to move across the room and back? Um, what do you think that means for the amplitude of this displacement and the phase of the displacement? Well, if you move that force so slow, there is no acceleration, there is no velocity. <clears throat> All we're going to have is a balance of the spring force. So the displacement has to be f over k. And if it's also moving so slow, um, the mass will easily track what we're, tra what we're inputting to the system. Right? So phi is going to be 0. So that's an important, important thing to note. There's two other interesting frequencies that are of interest. Um, what if omega goes towards omega n? And the other one, what if omega goes towards infinity? So at this point, at this point, I would ask the students to pair up in teams and try to think about this, whether they think about it intuitively or um, algebraically. Um, I'd give them a hint about maybe taking the limits of the functions. And I'd give, I'd, give, I'd give five minutes right here or so to have them sort of team think that out and see if they can come up with some guesses. And, it, and if they may guess right, they may guess wrong. And then I would uh, explain a little more here to uh, show them that this would be some constant times KO. That's probably, oops, sorry. That's sort of bad. And the phi will, in fact, go to pi over 2. And in this case, it's moving so fast that the amplitude can't grow in the output. And the phi will go to pi. <clears throat> so with this newfound information, this is, this is insightful, and it tells us a lot about the system, but we can get a bigger picture by, by using a graph. <clears throat> and so now we're going to make a plot called a frequency response plot. Right? And it's basically a graphical depiction of of these two equations we found for the amplitude of the, in the phase of the displacement. The first plot, we're concerned with the amplitude um, as the independent variable. The dependent, we're going to make the frequency ratio, omega over omega n. 
right? And we've already discovered a few important points. At omega equals zero, right? When omega and omega n equals zero, uh, we know that the amplitude will be F O over K. So I'm going to plot sort of the normalized uh, version of this displacement. Divide this by F over K, and then this will become one. So at zero, this is one. The next is that at omega over omega n, omega equals omega n, which will also make this ratio one, uh, we have some uh, scaled value of of the uh, um, of this of this f o over k, and then as it goes to infinity, right, this goes to zero. So what this plot, if you plot that out, typically looks like something like this. There's a peak that's close to the natural frequency of the system, and the amplitude goes to zero as you increase the frequency. And there's a constant, uh, an amplitude f over k uh, at zero. Now, a key thing to note here is that <clears throat> at some frequencies, you're going to get a lot more amplitude on your output than what you're putting in. <clears throat> and in fact, that maximum there is what we call the resonant frequency. And this is the frequency at which you can excite your system such that the, the mass grows. I mean, the, um, sorry, the amplitude of the, of the displacement grows uh, much higher than what your, 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 the amplitude that you're putting in. How much time do I got? You got calling me? So the last, uh, and the second part of this plot is that you plot the phase angle. You also plot this versus R omega over N. We found some values over here. We know that at zero, um, it's, it's also zero, the phase angle zero. Uh, at at uh, omega over n, it's always pi over 2. And then as we go to infinity, we get pi, we go to pi. And the phase angle looks something like this. Right? So the phase angle changes with, with, uh, with frequency. So, done? All right. Well, the last thing, if you guys want me to show you, I uh, didn't finish. As fast as my practices did, um, I'll show you the interactive part that I would have the students do in the lecture notes. So I'll close that off. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, we have time for a, a few questions. A lecture style. You got me. You're the top student in the class. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. What do you find when you teach when you make a mistake on the board? Um, I think it's rewarding that people are thinking and listening to me. Students when they, usually correct you. Is that what you find? Um, well, you know, it's always, I mean, in a big class, there's a few that are like often own, own you and they'll correct you. Uh, and then, and, but some people are shy. I'd like to develop, uh, you know, classes where you wouldn't be so shy to say that. So, uh, so giving, giving really positive feedback when they give you, uh, when they pick out a, uh, a point is, is important. Other questions? Comments? Barbara? So your, I like your lecture notes. They are very, very detailed, but the problem could be that if, if you give it to students beforehand, that they won't show up in class? Or what do you think about that? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, they can, they can find any lecture note they want on, online. They can watch videos of, me giving, of people giving this exact same lecture probably way better than I'm doing right now. And, and they don't have to come to class. Um, <clears throat> I want to create a classroom environment that, uh, you know, the reasons they come are because uh, they have active learning. They get to do things that um, they can't do just by reading or by um, uh, watching videos and things like that. So. Uh, what would I do? I mean, they're adults, and, and they cannot come to class if they want. I'm not the type that takes attendance, and I'm not the kind that slaps the desk when you're sleeping. But um, uh, I guess that's all I have to say. What's the relationship between the textbook, your lecture notes that you post, and what you actually do in class? Yeah. That, and, and how rigid is that? Well, 
uh, I would certainly, um, I guess the way, as far as textbooks are concerned, I, uh, I would use textbooks when I start and don't have material. But I'd hope that over time that I would essentially develop, you know, the materials that would um, be enough to supplant the textbook and hopefully uh, in this interactive format, right? And uh, <clears throat> so as far as how do I tie them all together, um, I would certainly, hopefully, uh, hopefully that all the pieces of the puzzle give, you know, different views of the material, the lecture, the notes that I provide, and the, um, and the textbook. Don't get me wrong, I'm actually very interested. I was very intrigued okay. everything, and I checked it out here while okay, you were cool. going along and all of that. Yeah. Uh, but, so, so it's all meant positive, but, but are, you, are you trying to supplant the textbook eventually? Because I actually think it's very important to have a textbook a year after you took a course and not just have some, you know, some online tools or, or things like that, right? Sure, so sure. Have a reference. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, well, if the if the reference that I create can be as rich as a textbook, which um, you know over over a time of teaching, I, I hopefully I would be able to develop one or more textbooks or something uh, in undergraduate teaching, and certainly that can be their reference, <clears throat> and uh, and hopefully it could be in this in this format if I'm lucky, right? And it would be as rich and informative as needed. Um, I would use a textbook um, alongside these, right, so that they have all that material, and, and certainly, uh, the I mean mo the textbooks are. So, you know, uh, say things much more eloquently than uh, my quick writing that I'm trying to put together for a lecture is going to do, so at least at first, right? I don't, does that answer your question? It answers half of it. The other half yeah. how, how does that restrict your, your lecture? Oh, how does that restrict? The, 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 the lecture notes, does that restrict what you want to do, or does it, or does it restrict? Do you freestyle after that? Once you start. If you lock into what you develop, so you can't react to the class, is that Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, how live is the class environment? Said, I'm going to do exactly this in this order. Oh, yeah. Or, or do, you stick to, I mean, do you not stick to that? Um, well, the main points are it, that are in the notes that, are, that need to get across eventually, right? Whether it takes one or two classes, right? And, um, and those things, I mean, I, I want to I get across the key concepts. Um, and uh, I, I guess that's, that's all. <laughs> Don't assume that the book is better than you because we, we use books for some classes that are awful. Oh, really? When you read them, you get ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully we can find uh, some. I have a quick question. Yes. You know, this, this is, I don't, have, I don't have a smartphone. I don't, I can't follow your thing at all. Sure. But the main thing is this. Is the object of this exercise for the student to use an app to solve these equations, or is it to actually write the app to solve these equations? Um, ultimately, both, right? And it's not—it's not about necessarily writing app. I, I can, I can. Yeah, well, I, I see the illustration where you yeah. just plug so, in a bunch of numbers and you get. The, well, uh, all all it boils down to is that I, uh, I give oh, yeah, I information, that. right? <clears throat> and uh, the thing that I wanted to get to at the end uh, was taking that graph that we did on the board, right. but, but making it a, a computation, right? So there's a bit of code, and I would tell them they can read that after after lecture. But the point is, is that there's eventually that I can plot the frequency response as a function of zeta and a particular so frequency. Well, yeah, in the home, I did, yeah, unfortunately didn't finish. And here during the class, like they could fiddle with this and see what what, it, what happens to the system when I, you know, when I change omega to grow the peak, amp the peak, uh, see what see the change in amplitude. So. You, You'd have a little interactivity that you can explore yourself to get a feel of things. And then finally, my homework problem that I wanted to present, but I wasn't really good on time, uh, was that they would derive um, another expression from here and then plot that line on this, on this same, in the same code. Use that code right there, modify it, and, uh, and, and plot a line there and see if they can learn a new, new piece of information about the system. So that's, that's, that's how. I would use that, and um, it would be partially, you know, providing a framework with some some code that they have to modify small things, and then for bigger homework problems, certainly giving them a, maybe a bigger computational task. You actually tried the green and red post-it method in, in a classroom. Yeah, yes. it works fabulously. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not, you think it would or what? Uh, my concern is it's easy to get into an information overload because it's so much. Often incoherent and so, well, so to react too much to the feedback and be 
worse than not reacting at all. That might be an unstable system, right? If, uh, <laughs> yeah, if I, take, if I uh, plug too much in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you, can, you can certainly try to force too many things in your class and get overwhelmed. But um, as far as that sticky, the sticky note idea, um, for example, one thing I could do, if you had a red and a green, I can put a true and false question on the board, right? And I say, everybody, think about this individually. If you, when you, if you think it's true and you think it's, or you think it's false, you know, put a red or a green. And then I just look over the classroom and I see oh, there are a lot of reds or a lot of greens. And at that point, I know, inst you know, in a second, whether or not people sort of get it. And so that's a very not time-consuming method of using using those. That and and you all, you probably are familiar too, right? There's electronic ways to do this too, and uh, I would certainly, for big classes, probably more effective. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop at this point. So let's thank Jason again. Thank you.